So let me welcome you all to this fourth session of uh, day one, Innovation for Social Impact. Uh, we have to be really innovative because uh, we are starting at 4 o'clock. We are supposed to vacate by 5. And I have 10 panel members. 10 into 8 makes 80. Not so there time. is no way. Not time. <laughs> so it's not. So what we'll do is that we'll do our best, uh, each one of us uh, uh, keeping to time. I'll also make only a short comment uh, as far as my own remarks are concerned. I think this is an extraordinarily important uh, session. In fact, life is a continuum, I believe. And uh, yesterday, uh, both Anil, myself, Ramji, many of us were in Pune. We had the first national social innovation seminar there. And countries leading around 120 thought leaders, people who have not just talked about ideas, but put those ideas in practice uh, made a big difference. Many of them game changing, they had arrived. And uh, this is kind of a continuation of that discussion that we had, which was only focused on social innovation. It was very fascinating. Today I kept on hearing about ecosystem. Yesterday somebody talked about ego system and how the ego system destroys the ecosystem. Uh, we talked about incubators here right all the time somebody said no we have to go beyond incubators and we have to look at a sanctuary what a beautiful word what a beautiful concept somebody talked about affordable excellence all right because despite income inequality how do you get access equality and access of the same quality not just affordable but also excellent these are terms that are contradiction uh, in uh, with uh, each other so it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, today's session, uh, we'll uh, look at innovation that are addressing the development challenges uh, faced by, I don't like this word, bottom of the pyramid. Uh, we should say base of the economic pyramid. Because the moment you say uh, uh, bottom of the pyramid, these people that we talk about many times, they are knowledge rich, idea rich, although they may be economically uh, sort of poor. So we have to have some respect for them and we'll say base of the economic pyramid, not the bottom, because bottom decides. Look, when we talk about a pyramid, the base is the foundation, so as to say. So they may be at the base, but there is a respectability attached to them. And uh, then we are going to look at several things like service delivery, uh, channels, value chains, uh, different sectors like health, education, agriculture. We are very fortunate to have had uh, uh, have uh, the presence of uh, some of the leaders in this space, uh, uh, 10 panelists. So as I said, the equation is 10 into 8 equal to 80. And my remarks have been one and a half minute. Uh, I want to leave some time for discussion at the end, but we'll see how it goes. My request to each one of you is to stick to the time that has been given to the panelists. Uh, we'll begin with Sir Ronald Cohen. He's joining us via video. A video. So can we uh, put it on, please? I'm delighted to be joining you in India in this way, since it was unfortunately impossible for me to join you in person. And I've been asked to say a few words about the British experience of impact investment. We seem to have discovered this area ahead of others and I would like to take you back to 2000 when the Social Investment Task Force was set up uh, and I began to work as its chair with its members to try to understand how we could improve the way in which we tackle social issues. All of us, even then, even more so now, had become aware of the fact that uh, as standards of living improve, the gap between rich and poor, instead of reducing, just kept on increasing. And those who were left behind were left permanently behind, with no chance of escape from poverty and lack of uh, education. Uh, equality of opportunity 
uh, had already in 2000 begun to be a bit of an empty phrase. What did it mean, equality of opportunity, if you were born into a family where both your parents had no jobs and might have a drug habit? And when I began to interview social organizations and to analyze uh, the system within which our society in Britain uh, was dealing with social issues, I discovered a number of su quite surprising things. First of all, I discovered that philanthropy for a hundred years or more had uh, focused on the act of giving rather than on achieving social outcomes. It had uh, typically helped non-profit organizations by saying to them, you can have money for two or three years, don't spend any on your overheads, and as a sanity check, then go and raise money from somebody else. This had led to a huge social sector. In uh, the UK, it comprises over 800,000 uh, organizations, virtually none of whose constituents had achieved any scale at all. And uh, I realized recently that numbers had been collected in the United States on this phenomenon, where in the space of 25 years, 50,000 companies had gone through $50 million of sales, and only 144 nonprofits had. And in 2000, we began to ask ourselves, how can we do for social entrepreneurs and for social organizations what we've done, what I was privileged to be able to do through venture capital for business entrepreneurs? After all, the tech revolution was funded in large part by venture capitalists, and young entrepreneurs led it. What if we were able to do the same thing with social issues? In those days, it was obvious to me that I could do what I had done at Apex, which was to buy stakes in companies which had good prospects, to buy stakes in companies, but this time in the poorest 25% of the country. And that's how Bridges Ventures started. And if you fast forward 10 years, Bridges Ventures today manages over $500 million. Instead of delivering 10 to 12% net returns, it's delivered 15% plus. And we proved over the last decade that entrepreneurship really knows no social or economic or educational boundaries, that entrepreneurs in poor areas are just as highly or even more motivated than those in the mainstream economy, that uh, the business models that you design in these poorer areas are more price sensitive from the perspective of the consumer and more investment effective from the point of view of the investor uh, than mainstream investments. But that in itself wasn't going to answer the question that I was asking myself about the fragmentation of the social sector, what used to be called the third sector. And in 2005, when the government began to negotiate with the big banks here to take away from them bank accounts which had been separated from their owners for 15 years or more, I was asked to chair the Commission on Unclaimed Assets and to pick up one of the recommendations we made in 2000, which was that to answer this question about the funding of non-profits, we really needed financial innovation and we needed, in order to achieve that, to create a social investment bank that would bring together people who understood both social issues uh, and finance. In 2007, we created social finance, and by 2010, social finance had developed and implemented the first social impact bond. Based on the successes of Bridges and social finance and many of the other organizations which had uh, come into being since the Social Investment Task Force in the UK, when the coalition came to power, 
in 2010, it began to be interested in the idea of giving all of its unclaimed assets, which were expected to be of the order of 400 million pounds. As you will find out in the future, the, the sums are actually going to be greater than that. And to persuade the banks to provide a couple of hundred million pounds of additional equity to create the social investment bank that we had recommended. And I worked with Nick O'Donoghue, who had been at JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, to submit a business plan to the government. And at the beginning of 2012, Big Society Capital came into being with 600 million pounds of capital. And I became its non-executive chairman and Nick O'Donoghue its chief executive. And fast forwarding since then, we can see that there is a huge demand for capital in the social sector. We have seen a number of social impact bond issues raised and we have participated in those. But just as importantly, we've seen almost uh, a dozen organizations become interested in launching social investment funds of one kind or another. Some are generalist funds which address all social issues, some focus more on education or on employment or on health. But I think the message for all of you uh, today is a very clear one. It's becoming obvious that investment to tackle social issues can apply to non-profits as well as for-profit companies. It's becoming obvious that the sums that could potentially be attracted to this form of investment are huge. In charitable foundations alone in the United Kingdom, there are a hundred billion pounds of capital. In the United States, there's a trillion dollars. If we only manage to attract between 3 and 5% of this money, we would match at 3% all of the money being given away by these charitable foundations in a year. And at the 5% level, all of the money that's being given away philanthropically by charitable foundations in the United States. For those of you who come from the financial business, I would put it this way. We're in the process of creating a new asset class, one that can deliver, in addition to an important social return, a financial return of 7 to 10 percent a year, not correlated with the stock market, going up and down with it, but depending on the improvement in literacy or the eradication of malaria or of sleeping sickness or attainment levels at school or a reduction in the dropout rate from school or any of the other issues including uh, reoffending that I have described. Potentially we're on the brink of a revolution of social entrepreneurship just as 30 or 40 years ago when I started out with venture capital, we were on the brink of a revolution in business entrepreneurship, which, it needs to be said, brought about the tech revolution. My hope is that this new generation of social entrepreneurs will bring about a social revolution that begins to give everyone in our society a chance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Of course, uh, we can't hear your applause. Uh, there were some wonderful thoughts. Uh, I uh, uh, just wanted to mention that you heard Sir Ronald Cohen, the chair of Big Society Capital uh, from United Kingdom just now. Uh, we move on to our next panelist, uh, our friend uh, Dr. Saurav Srivastava. Uh, we'll take the stage now. Don't want to introduce him again. Sam did a very eloquent job of introducing him uh, in the morning. He's a doyen 
among technopreneurs, uh, venture capital uh, instruments in India, and also, must say, the mastermind behind this very ambitious fund, India Inclusive Innovation Fund, that is being uh, set up, which will reach finally a billion dollar, hopefully. Saurav. Thank you very much, Dr. Mashelkar. Uh, as you know, the National Innovation Council, since it's been in place, has done, has launched a number of very successful initiatives. Uh, the one that I talk about very briefly today, the India Inclusive Innovation Fund, uh, is the one initiative that I elected uh, to lead. And it's very much in the context of what you heard from Sir Ronald Cohen uh, a minute ago. Uh, the thesis is very simple. The lives of all of us in, in this room are immeasurably better today than they were 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, because we found a model that combines innovation with the dynamism of enterprise and creates in a scalable way organizations that provide products, services, create wealth, employment, that transform our lives. <laughs> That's a model that Sir Ronald Cohen will talk about. It attracts the best brains in the world which then attract trillions of dollars of capital that's willing to take a risk on innovation that eventually transforms the way we live, the way we work, the way we talk, the way we communicate, everything. But when it comes to the base of the economic pyramid, uh, then th that class of capital in trillions of dollars is not available. Mostly it's served by philanthropy, which is not that large a number, it's spent very often th or mostly through non-governmental organizations, very passionate, committed people who do great work. Uh, but when the money stops, the work stops because creating scalable organizations is neither their strength nor focus. Uh, the other class of capital is government grants. Again, you need philanthropy, you need government grants for, for people at, <coughs> at the real base of the pyramid. But what you also, need to have is a, another model which is also scalable, which leverages the dynamism of enterprise. And so in the fund, in the Indian Inclusive Innovation Fund, what we're trying to do is precisely that. Look at investing in ventures that will be scalable and profit, profitable, but will serve the base of the economic pyramid. We want to attract the best brains in the world, certainly in India, uh, to work in this area and basically the, create another asset class of investors who would be happy with modest financial returns coupled with measurable social returns. That's the thesis that, that we're on the fund. Uh, the way we're doing it, as Dr. Mashelkar said, ambition, our ambition, our aspiration is for this to be a billion dollar fund, very much like the big society fund is uh, in the UK. Uh, but the way we're doing it, the big society fund, two thirds of the capital was put in by the UK government, the balance by banks. In the Bridges Ventures, uh, venture capital fund he talked about, half the capital came from government. Uh, the way we're doing it here is requesting the government to put in 20% of the capital and the balance would come from other sources, including, uh, multilateral agencies uh, such as DFID and others in, in the UK. Uh, we are planning to start it in the next few months with an initial uh, first closing of a hundred million dollars and then we will continue to see how far we can scale it uh, over time and we have looked around this. Our focus is going to be in the sectors that are the challenges in India, health, education, uh, off-grid uh, solutions for clean energy, uh, all, all the areas that you look at as challenge, as, as food. Uh, and we would be focusing on the seed in early stage rather than on late stage uh, opportunities. Uh, we wouldn't only be just a venture fund that's investing. The idea behind this fund would be to help strengthen the ecosystem. So there will be a focus on creating a mentoring network that can work with entrepreneurs that are invested in. There's a focus on working with different incubation centers that are around the country. Uh, and we're trying to learn from the experiences of everybody else. So 
who spent time with Sir Ronald Cohen, with Bridges Ventures, uh, any number of meetings with Nesta. Uh, we try to learn what we can from what experience people have had. We think we have a, a good chance of creating a new kind of model because it's unfortunate, but we are home to the world's largest poor. That means we have scale if we create things that will work. We have at the same time while we have the challenges, the world, world class entrepreneurs, access to the best technologies that we create or can acquire. So there's every reason why we can actually prove this model on scale. And at the moment, while we're really a sieve, we're learning from what everybody has done, we'd like it, all countries to participate because as we create different models, as we test, uh, we would then like those models that work here to be adopted by people around the world. That's where we are. We'd love for all of you to engage. We'd love your views, your thoughts, what has worked for you, what has not worked for you. Uh, and over the next few years, hopefully we'll build something that is of real value uh, to the base of the economic pyramid. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. <clears throat> I'm sure you will. Uh, our uh, next panelist is uh, Mr. Mark uh, Rosario, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of National Innovation Agency in Malaysia. Thank you. Uh, this morning, I, I talked about how our agency was set up and we have uh, basically about 20 ongoing initiatives that is covering the whole spectrum of innovation from, from education to, to helping the private sector and looking at wealth creation opportunities for the country. Now, uh, in this area of uh, innovation for social impact, um, we, I, I'd like to share an initiative that we have uh, embarked on which is targeted at low-income households. It's a program that's uh, it's called GIGE, which is a Malay word uh, that means determination. That's our Prime Minister who's uh, launching the program for us. Uh, this was uh, at the end, sorry, it was a, about six months ago. And what, what this is doing, uh, we call it a reverse challenge. What we're actually doing is uh, getting ideas from individuals or micro enterprises around the country, asking them to submit their recipes to us. Uh, these are proven recipes where they have managed to, to uh, generate additional income for themselves and their families. And this, this is sort of like a competition. So, so they submit their ideas and we would basically look for the, uh, we applied three criteria to see uh, which of these ideas can be shared with the low income groups for them to pick up and generate income for themselves. So we had uh, 2,700 entries coming in and our, our intention was to, to look through all of these and pick 50 of them that we could then use to share with the uh, targeted low income groups around the country. The selection criteria was based on whether it can be replicated, whether it's sustainable, and whether it's scalable. So using these three criteria, we, we narrowed down from the 2,700 to these 50 uh, recipes. Now, why, why are we doing this? 40% of Malaysian households earn below uh, 2,300 ringgit, which is about uh, $800. These are 40% of the households in, in Malaysia. Our, our per capita income is about uh, 10,000 US dollars. So there is quite a disparity there if you look at so many people falling into this category. So what we did was we, we targeted the group uh, that earns less than uh, $500 a month, which is below the average of, of the bottom 40. And using these, these 50 ideas, uh, it's actually in, 
produced in the, into a booklet like this. There's, there's 50 of them. Uh, I can share it with anyone, although it's all in Malay, though. The reason it's all in Malay is because uh, most, most of those in that uh, category uh, would tend to, to only speak Malay and not, not so much English. So we shared, we, we, we've got our team going out there and trying to find these people who would be willing, who would want to pick this up for themselves and generate income for themselves. So, so what we're doing, we, we sort of package it into a very simple way and, and have, uh, we, we're trying to get initially a thousand people to pick this up, pick up these 50. So why, how did we get 2,700 people to share their recipes with us? We offered a price. Uh, there was a cash price for these 50, the best 50, and also an incentive in the form of any, every replication would also get a, a sort of a, a cash incentive for the person that shared uh, his recipe with us. So they are also acting as mentors now, and, and so they're going out there and, and they're helping people to start these things. So uh, for us, we, we see this as a sort of social innovation. We're, we're helping the lower income group to generate income for themselves, uh, as opposed to the government just giving out handouts, which you know will never end. So, so this, this is a sustainable way for them to, to be generating income for themselves. And I, I have uh, another initiative, but perhaps in the interest of time, I, I, I won't go through that. But I just wanted to share this, this particular initiative with you. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent presentation and also for your understanding. I now move on to our next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Honorul. He is uh, the India Country Director, World Bank. Thank you very much. And, um, Thank you very much for, for having me. It's, um, it's, it's great to be able to speak about this a little bit, especially because most of what I'll say will be said better by my neighbor, Shelley. Um, public organizations like the World Bank and governments uh, often struggle to see how we can solve large development problems, how to say, in the case Shelley will talk about delivering uh, TB um, medications to avoid uh, multi-drug resistant TB. But there's many such problems. And, my mental image is that um, all of us were sort of up here realizing we've got a challenge, then try to define uh, a solution. And our struggle, if you go to India, is to go from Delhi to, say, Patna to some district block and eventually reach a result in a village. And we push down and down. Um, but we don't usually are very successful, uh, whether we're World Bank or government, and the government of India is not in particularly, uh, particularly guilty of this. All governments struggle with the same as to actually how to deliver results that reach people, individuals that we can name and recognize. Now, social entrepreneurs do the opposite uh, often. They, they start from the need at the local level and they try to develop something on there, whether profit or non-profit. So they, they start at the bottom and try to reach up, but then at some point they reach a stage where they have gone up, but they don't know how to reach into the formal system to actually scale. So both of us face the issue of how do we scale in the case of uh, the, the, the government uh, or the World Bank or other public institutions, we try to scale a solution that we don't know what the solution is already. And from the, from the, from the bottom of the pyramid, or the base of the pyramid, the base of the, you had a much more elegant uh, description of it, which, which I'll, I shall remember tomorrow. Um, from the base anyway, they have a solution and try to reach the formal system to scale the solution, a really difficult challenge. So, um, I really welcome that we're talking about this uh, today. I can't offer any solutions. I, I do think it's really, so at the World Bank also, with our colleagues from IFC, we run competitions to generate ideas. It is extremely rare that the ideas we generate are scaled up. It is extremely rare that they actually manage to connect themselves to formal programs and reach sustainable funding bases, unless they're profit-making. But unfortunately, not all development solutions can be viably solved through profit-making ventures. So I can only um, offer some thoughts as to what are the, what are the issues we have to break through uh, in order to reach scalability. So first of all, both in the World Bank and some governments that I've worked with in the past, um, we often find um, what, we, what I would describe as the all-knowing bureaucrat who feels that 
they not only do they know everything, they also feel they're responsible for devising the solution to everything, including how to get to the grassroots level. Well, this would be a very important phenomenon to overcome. Another hurdle we often find is what many people call the not invented here syndrome, which means that a relatively large number of people do not like to implement solutions that are not solutions that they think they invented themselves. Um, and uh, thus having issues of ownership. This is philosophically extremely difficult when you think of solving a problem from a very high level of aggregation to reach a result very deep down because it's extremely l unlikely that the solution will be devised by the person up. It is much more likely that it comes from down. And again, I accuse nobody in particular except the World Bank. I'm, I'm entitled to accuse the World Bank. Um, because we suffer from the same problems as, uh, as many other public institutions. It can actually really work very well. But if you go from the, the down, then what I often find is that uh, people who devise solutions and we meet them in these competitions are so proud of the fact that they found a grassroots solution that they can often feel that the purity of the solution can be disturbed by linking with some kind of formal program, which works the opposite way as the not invented here syndrome from the top, but has the same result, which means it's really difficult to connect the bottom to the top in practical terms to achieve results. Now, sometimes we strike gold. I will not tell Shelley's story because she will tell it herself, but I'll tell you the story of Sanjoy Hazarika, who had the idea of having a boat to go on the Brahmaputra River and, uh, and reach the island dwellers with the National Rural Health Mission. Our innovation marketplace put in I don't, um, couldn't have been more than $50,000 to finance the first boat. Uh, Sanjoy and his team now actually deliver the National Rural Health Mission services with the resources of the National Rural Health Mission to 200,000 island dwellers. So in that case, the connection was made. My essential point is that it would be really important for those of us who talk about how to achieve sustainable result, results through innovation by social entrepreneurs to understand the cultural difference, differences, differences and therefore difficulties in actually achieving this objective and devise mechanisms that probably go beyond competitions, which is our only real thing right now, to overcome these differences because there is magic in this approach, but it is extremely difficult to reach the magic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very perceptive, very insightful uh, remarks. Uh, we move on to our uh, next uh, distinguished panelist, uh, Mr. Jeff Mulgan. He is uh, the chief executive of uh, Nesta. Jeff. Well, good afternoon. I'm going to try and go at breakneck pace through some, uh, <coughs> a little bit about what we do in this space, if slides are appearing, uh, which they are. Uh, so my colleague, uh, Kirsten Bounds, said a little bit about what we do at Nesta. We are a slightly strange hybrid of in endowment for science, technology, and the arts, but also commercial investor, uh, research organization, and run experimental programs. So I'm just gonna focus in on what we do in this space. I think that the big picture worth keeping in mind is the world has at least a century of experience of putting in place systems of innovation for science or for the market. And it took many, many decades to get these uh, to get these to work, and they are now quite mature systems with protocols, jobs, financing methods, and so on. Uh, we all know, however, the enormous imbalances in what gets funded in the market, as Sam and others have said and that relative to social needs, we still have remarkably undeveloped systems for how to innovate for public benefit. We are perhaps 50 years behind what there is in fields like aerospace, military technologies, uh, or for that matter, uh, business uh, investment. Um, that's beginning to change. In the last even five years, we've seen an institutionalization of social innovation. Almost none of these existed in the middle of the last decade. Social innovation parks, exchanges, funds in countries like France, Hong Kong, Australia. There are teams in government in countries from Colombia to the UK, incubators, Obama has an office, uh, mayors like the mayor of Seoul are making this a defining part of their work. There are social innovation prizes in China, the EU, and labs and so on, and also social innovation units in the big consultancies, McKinsey, Deloitte, and others, a, a rather important sign uh, of the times in the last year or two. 
So it's beginning to spread. There's also many examples of social innovation at scale. Some people still think this is about small marginal projects, but from Pratam here in India, Seoul City in South Africa, uh, collaborative consumption sites like couch surfing, which now has more beds than all the international <laughs> hotel chains combined. Many, many examples of things reaching tens of millions of people, which again was not really obvious even 10 years ago. Um, late last week, we hosted in London a, an academic conference of people from 40 countries doing academic research on social innovation beginning to become a pretty serious field, a lot is known, and again, almost none of that existed a decade ago. And it's rather like the study of technology innovation was perhaps 30, 35 years ago when there wasn't very much then. So what's happening? I'm just gonna focus in on a couple of um, fields very briefly. So first of all, building on what Ronald Cohen said, we've got a, a lot happening around new tools for finance here and around the world. I worked in the British government uh, about 12 years ago. We did our first version of this map, trying to look at financing needs for social ventures from the very, very small to um, growth capital to large scale. And over the last 12 years, we've essentially tried to fill in every step of that journey from accelerator, incubator, seed capital, through um, medium-sized capital to the wholesale bank, big society capital, which Ronnie uh, described. And it's only just beginning to become a mature ecology, if I'm allowed to use the word ecology. Slightly problematic uh, concept, perhaps. And a lot of interesting examples of how money can be used. So I won't say more about BSC. I'm on its board. We're still experimenting as a wholesaler with what will really work in financing intermediaries. At the other end of the spectrum, we at Nesta are funding not only a lot of commercial accelerators, but also mixed-purpose accelerators, and this is one we actually host in our building. Very disciplined, managed cohort support for startups with mixed financial and social goals. We have our own impact investment fund, making rather larger scale investments in ventures and also using other tools. So there is, for example, a center for challenge prizes in Nesta, which uses inducement prizes, not just for so a classic technology inducement, as in energy, but also things like food waste. We're about to next week award a series of prizes for really good innovations to reduce the massive waste of food you get in countries like the UK. We have new hybrid funds. We have a, a digital R&D fund for the arts, which links arts organizations with tech firms and researchers. And since the creative economy is 10% of GDP in Britain, almost the same as manufacturing, this is quite important from an economic point of view as well as many other points of view. And Ronald Cohen mentioned social impact bonds. We've now got about 23 in the UK, a new financing tool for social outcomes. We won't know for many years whether it really works, but it's exactly the sort of thing which warrants experimentation. The other thing happening worth sharing, I think, is new models of state action. We are, at the moment, about halfway through a study with um, Bloomberg Philanthropy, funded by Mike Bloomberg, looking at innovation teams within national governments, city governments, uh, and regions. These are a few of the examples we're looking at. Uh, some be very familiar with you around the table. What's interesting is quite a few of these are bringing new methods, methods from design, methods from data, methods from behavioral economics, and applying them to multiple problems around government. Most of them are working very fast, much faster than traditional bureaucracies, much more driven by uh, data, and almost all of them trying to tip it, tap into citizen ideas rather than just the ideas of bureaucrats and politicians. And if you're interested, we'll be publishing in February the results of these and recommendations, both of them successes, but also the failures of I-teams of this kind. One of these is our own innovation lab, which includes a joint team with the British Cabinet Office uh, and a range of things from mayor's challenges for, for mayors across Europe to um, uh, programs in everything from giving to energy to education. I just thought I'd focus in 30 seconds each on three examples of what for us is, as it were, the cutting edge of being an innovation agency. Some of our work in some ways is quite classic, technology development, technology transfer, the sorts of things these sort of round tables have talked about for 20, 30 years. But some we're trying to experiment with the ways in which we work. 
So in this example in education, we're trying to make it easier for basically as many British children as possible to, be, to learn the skills of digital making, how to code, how to program, how to make websites, animations, Arduino robots, and so on, rather than just being passive consumers of PowerPoint, Excel, and so on. And for that, we've been running a campaign. We've been persuading government to make computer science part of the curriculum, which they've now accepted, providing online tools, make things do stuff. You'll see there is an online platform which any of your kids can use for learning how to make things digitally, but also coordinating a, a large coalition of corporates from Facebook to foundations like Mozilla to try and make digital making part of the everyday. And that's alongside commercial investment in companies uh, with digital tech tools, but where we're measuring not just their financial return, but also their educational impact on the kids who need it most. So a slightly different way of working to what we might have done in the past. A second example, very much a work in progress, is around jobs. Um, most governments, city and national, know quite well how to cultivate high-tech, high-value, creative economies in, their, in what they do, providing jobs for maybe 5 or 10% of the population. Everywhere they say they don't really know how to spread the innovation economy to the majority, how to help them take part in the dynamic areas of growth, which is why you have stagnant wages for perhaps half the US population, perhaps a third in countries like mine. So we're looking at using innovation methods and applying them to jobs, studying the best jobs innovations from around the world, some very tech enabled, some not, using big data to analyze labor markets in new ways, and you'll see one we've just done, using web scraping to track uh, new um, vacancies. We run a, a Europe-wide prize for tech-enabled jobs innovations, and we're, we're trying to find the best ways of using the sort of skills agencies like you have for this fundamental social challenge, which has oddly been largely ignored by innovation agencies in the past. And a final example of a sort of innovation method is around health. Again, most of our countries know how you develop pharma, med tech, and so on, but in our system, at least, the big productivity improvements will not come from a new drug or a new piece of med tech. They require quite radical change to the health system, often mobilizing people's own capacity to look after their own health or to support their family, their friends, and so on. So we've been developing methods of systemic innovation, working with doctors, NGOs, as well as the National Health Service on a combination of bottom-up grassroots innovation and top-down policy redesign. And again, we'd love to talk with you. What are the methods which really work in this sort of systemic change? Just one final point. Um, we, we love innovation, and most people here probably do as well but we have to constantly remind ourselves it's a means and not an end, and it's only as good a process as the results which uh, appear. And so the other thing which has been a big part of our work in, in the last year or so, which Kirsten mentioned, is the focus on evidence, getting much more transparent access to evidence on what really works. We host the Alliance for Useful Evidence, which has about 1,500 organizations in it now, we persuaded the British government to set up what will now be seven what work centers providing access to information on what interventions do or do not work. And we've been trying to share a sort of methodology for analyzing um, approaches to see what their levels of evidence are. And just last week, Pearson, a large, well, the world's leading education company committed to using this method within their own business for judging efficacy of educational products. And perhaps the most interesting example of all, which you can't really see, is the little thing at the bottom there. We're beginning to use big data to track implementation of innovation in big systems like the health system. And we see this as a vital part of this whole sort of story, that we both get more creativity, more experiment, more discovery, but also much more rigor in finding out what really works, what really delivers. And that will hopefully take us to as comprehensive a system for inclusive innovation as the systems which emerged over 50, 80 years in the last century in science and in the market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I'm an admirer of the journey of uh, NISTA over the years. I've seen you uh, move towards uh, 
uh, these objectives uh, in a very, very interesting way.